Bible says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. The first two words of that verse, for this, it shows up a lot in the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, in chapter number one, we see for this cause, I obtain mercy. Chapter number two, for this is good and acceptable. We're looking at that now. Chapter three, we'll see that this is a true saying. Ver uh, chapter four, we'll see again, this is, and then it talks about a faithful saying. Chapter number four, it says, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. And it, and it goes on, but it's, it's this is or for this. It's very simply, it's opposed to that. It brings in an opposition. And it's there because we just talked about our manner of life. And it ties into what was seen in verse number one. Our supplications, our prayers, our intercessions, our giving of thanks. Then we learned about our Christian life, which is supposed to be peaceable. It's supposed to be quiet. It's supposed to be godly. It's supposed to be honest. And because of all of those things, for this manner of life, it says all of, all of this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Living that way is good, it's valid, it is proper. And God commands it as a principle for us to live. I don't care what, what the state of society is in. I think too many people are concerned about the state of our culture and where that's going. I can tell you where it's going. It's going the same way that it's always gone. But for this, I'm not worried about that. For this, I know how I'm supposed to live my life. And too many Christians get bogged down. Well, that's going on. Well, that person. Well, how about for this? <laughs> How about we do what we're called to do? Pray. And we went through it. Live quiet life, peaceable life, honest life, godly life. We see these acceptable things throughout the word of God to the Lord. In Romans 12, we learn how we can present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And God tells us that is acceptable to him. And it's reasonable. For us to serve God that way. In Romans 12, we also see, don't be conformed to this world. It talks about having the renewing of our mind. And that is acceptable. And that's the perfect will of God. There's some things that are expected by God for us. And those are the things that are acceptable to God. He makes some reasonable, he puts some reasonable expectations on you and I as his children. And it's acceptable. Romans 14 talks about serving Christ and that's acceptable to God. We should live our life in, in that way. In the sight of God, it says, for this is good and acceptable. The last half of verse number three says, in the sight of God, our Savior. And this theme runs all through Timothy, Titus. It comes up in 2 Peter. And it, this idea of God, our Savior. Paul talks about he's an apostle. It's by the commandment of God, our Savior. He talks about his preaching. It's committed unto him according to the commandment of God, our Savior. In Titus chapter 1, grace and mercy and peace. You know where it comes from? God, our Savior. Titus talks about in chapter 2, showing all good fidelity. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. That's the doctrine that we preach. It's of God, our Savior. Our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God... And Savior. All of it's tied into our God and our Savior. But after the kindness and love of guess who? God our Savior toward man appeared. 
to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know who glory, majesty, and dominion belongs to? God, our Savior. Praise the Lord. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And it's not only an emphasis of what is good and acceptable. The first half of the verse talks about what is good and acceptable. Verses 1 and verses 2 explains that and we preach them. The last half of chap of verse number 3 clearly gives us to whom is it, it is acceptable unto. There's a lot of things that are acceptable in this book. I just want to be accepted. That's how cults get their members. People longing for acceptance. And they're taking advantage of they end up in Guyana drinking cooling with some cult leader. These cults are all over the place. They prey on people who are looking for acceptance. And if people don't understand their Bibles well enough, they're going to get mixed up in what is good and what is acceptable. <laughs> and to whom it should be acceptable too. You don't live your life looking for acceptance from man. You can't find acceptance in a group. You can only find it. What do we sing about? If you are dressed in his righteousness, if you are accepted in the beloved, that is where we want to point you to. That is where your acceptance comes. And then we teach the Bible. We preach the Bible. We evangelize. We disciple. We fellowship. We pray. We do all of that because of all of us are accepted in the beloved. We want to live our lives being acceptable to him. All right, let's throw irresistible grace right out the window in this next verse. You ready? Buckle, buckle, buckle your seatbelts. Bible says, who will, who will have all men to be saved. What do we just get done talking about? God, our Savior. And now we get God's will, who will, that would be God our Savior, have all men to be saved. This is the definitive purpose of God our Savior. His will is expressed here. If God's will is to save all, then man should align his will with God's will. There isn't a problem with God's will. There's a problem with man's will. We should be praying that God's will be done. Why? Because before I got saved and before you got saved, your will and my will, our wills were against God's will. And so we are praying for God's will to be done. Make sense? People talk about sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God. The problem is the sovereignty of man. That has always been the problem. Man wants to be sovereign. Man wants his way. Not God we have to talk about. He is powerful enough to do whatever he wants to do. He's omnipotent. It's man defying God. That's our depravity. Man thinks that he is sovereign and above the Lord and over the Lord. But all he is is against the Lord's will for his life. What is God's will for your life? To get in line with the will of God. Repent and trust. Christ is saved. Now let me read to you what Augustine said. When he got to this verse. The Bible says, who will have all men, he said, by all, understand all the predestinated. 
because men of all sorts are among them. I don't know. I'd like to just stick with the Bible meaning all. It's simpler to me. It's simpler to me. In other words, when you look at verses 1 and 2, kings as well as everyday people. It doesn't matter if you're in authority or not in authority. Okay? You can be, we, we're, we're going to pray for you. All those that are, that are in authority. It don't matter if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. Bond or free, it, it, none of that matters. But Augustine, I read you what Augustine had to say, because Augustine, on this verse, he had a huge impact on John Calvin. Augustine is mentioned 70 times in Calvin's first edition of his Institutes. And Calvin sought to limit the meaning of these verses, including this one, where all men just refers to all sorts of men. I honestly think the only way you can come up with that is by reading books about man's philosophy on the Bible rather than just reading and studying the Bible. I don't want to read books authored by men who have a philosophy. I want to read the book authored by God who's got some truth for me. I'm not saying don't read books. What I'm saying is every book you read and I read, we have to filter through the book. Okay? I read books, that's all I do. I got nine books I'm reading on Romans, all at the same time. How do you do that? With a very patient wife is how I do it. Because there's three books here. There's one book in another room, and it's flipped over like this. There's another book that I had a, a dog ear in that somebody closed, or I closed, and I need to blame somebody so it couldn't have been me. And so I got books all over the place. I read books. I want you to read books. But all those books need to be filtered through the book. And you'd be surprised how much men say that doesn't line up with this book. This is why I want to try to be as careful as I can, because all I'm doing is commentating on the text. Your authority is the Bible, not what I say on the Bible. You got to stick with the book. Okay, let's continue to go down into deep waters in this next on the next few comments. Number one, I made a big deal about verse number four, who will have all men to be saved. Calvinists would say, why would God will something that he cannot make happen? In other words, if it was God's will that all be saved, how come all aren't saved? Now, you got to admit, that's a pretty good question. Did you know that every single modern version, the New King James included, removes the word will from the Bible? You won't find it in any one. If you do, let me know, and I'll change my study on it. You won't find who will. You will find who wants, who would, who desires. You won't find will. You will not find God's will on any modern Bible version. You only find it in the book right here. But if God honestly wanted everyone to be saved, I mean, wouldn't they just be saved? And if they're not, well, then wouldn't God's sovereignty be in question? And so because of that, okay, what are you going to do with 2 Peter 3? Not willing that any should perish. God's will. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should what? Come to what? Repentance. It seems pretty clear to me. John 5, uh, verse 40, that ye will not come, that ye might have life. That is man's will in direct defiance to God's will. What is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 finished with? Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is God's will concerning all men. That they would come to the knowledge of the truth. 
You know what that shows us all? Essentially, it shows us all the condition that we are in. Lost and undone. Look at that verse again. Who does the invitation go out to? What is God's will? Verse number four. Who will have all men to be saved. Okay, great. Praise the Lord. What is the invitation? And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. I would like you to come unto church. No. Okay. I would like you to come unto church. No. Okay. I would like you to come unto the church. Nobody in the town could accuse the pastor of not wanting people to come to church. I've invited everyone. My will is that they would come. God's will is that his house would be filled. We are to go out and, to, and compel them. But they don't all come. It's not a problem with me inviting or you inviting or God is being sovereign in inviting. It is a problem with the sovereignty of man. He wants to be sovereign. He does not want to put his will in subjection to God's will. You don't want to line it up. But there is an invitation that goes out. Come unto the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. We'll look at that more next week. And one mediator between God and men. The man. Christ Jesus. And so let's just throw a limited atonement out. In verse number six right now as well. Watch this. Who gave. Who gave. Who gave himself. A ransom. For all, pretty easy, to be testified in due time. That doesn't sound like it's limited to me. I know Calvin's wrote more books than me. I know Piper's wrote more books than me. I know John Owen's got a bunch of stuff. Look, I've read it all. Uh, the death of Christ and, and, and all that. Death of death and death of Christ, mortification of sin. Look, I've gone through all of it, all of it. And I, when I filter it through the book, I come out believing the book more. God's will is that all would be saved. I'm asking you to do the same thing with me. And I'm asking you and me to do the same thing with whoever's preaching the word of God. I'm going to give you the best they got through prayerful study, through diligent work. But look, you've got to stick with this book. You can't take what I say or any man says. I believe there's an invitation that goes out, out to all. Okay, so. Well, what about Matthew 20? Because in 1 Timothy 2, okay, it says ransom for all. But Matthew 20, it doesn't say ransom for all. You know what it says? Ransom for many. So let's go there. Why don't we look at Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28. Let's see if we can make. Well, we're not going to make the sense of it. We're going to try to have the Bible make some sense for us. Go to Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. Okay, here it is. Verse number 27. Twenty-seven. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even, verse 28, as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom, here it is, for many. You have a seemingly contradiction in the Bible. Is God saying that he gave his life a ransom for all? Or is God saying he gave his life a ransom for many? Well, he's saying both, quite obviously, right? Well, many isn't all. Let's see if we can have the Bible define what we're talking about. Keep your finger in Matthew 20 and go and then go back to your Matthew chapter number two first. Because Matt, or, 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 I'm sorry, first Timothy chapter number two. <laughs> First Timothy chapter number two, verses one and two, and then verses four through six, 
defines the many that we just read in Matthew 20, 28. And I'm going to show you why. In 1 Timothy chapter number 2, when you see in verse number 1, for all men, and in verse number 2, for all that are in authority, uh, verse number 4, who would have all men to be saved, verse number 5, uh, uh, verse number 6, rather, uh, who gave himself a ransom for all. The context of these verses is very clearly, and we'll, we'll unpack this some more after I make this statement. It is very clearly unsaved people who are not in church. How do I know that? The first clue is this. Watch it, verse number two. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we, who's the we, lead a peace and quiet, peaceful life. Who's the we? That would be us, saved people. You, the contrast starts right there with the we, contrasting the them. We are saved; they are not saved. We are in church, part of the body of Christ. They are not part of the body of Christ. What are we supposed to do? We preached on it a couple of Thursdays ago. Pray for them. That they would leave us alone. Okay? Now, watch, watch this. Go down to verse number nine. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Who's that in clear reference to? Saved people who were in the body of Christ. Paul draws out this distinction between verses 1 through 6 and then verses 8 and 9 with verse number 7 as he calls himself out as a preacher and apostle in Christ, teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in verity. He distincts himself. He, he draws himself out. Now, and now he talks to in verse number eight and nine, he talks to saved people. Watch at verse nine. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with void hair or gold or pearls or costly array, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do you serve the authority over the man. But to be in subjection, what is this all in context for the man in verse number eight and the woman in verse nine, 10, 11, what we just read? It's all in context to what? Save people who are in the body of Christ in the setting of a church. Matthew 20, 28. Who's the many? You picking up what God's putting down? You have two references to all in first Timothy chapter number two. You have all men that are not saved, and then you have all men that are saved. It's pretty easy for me to piece together a ransom for all and a ransom for many. Because when we're talking about all the people that are in the church, guess who it isn't all the people of? Out of the church. Verse number eight and nine, every man lift up his hands. That is not in reference to the guy across the street that, that, that's as lost as he can be. He's the all found in verses 1 and verses 2 and verses 4 and verses 6. Make sense? Pretty easy to me to reconcile that many, ransom for many, and ransom for all. You know those kings and those that are in authority? They can't be elect because they're not in Christ. Verses 8, verses 9, 10, 11. Guess what? You're in Christ. You are. You are elect. You're in the elect one. Let me show you how God doesn't get his way. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn to, where are we going? 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 
flip back a page and we should be there. But before I get there, one of my favorite Old Testament passages is Numbers chapter 13 and 14. God has a will for his people, the nation of Israel. And he's got 12 spies that are going to be sent out. Moses is told to, by God to send those spies and they're to go conquer Canaan. That's God's will. Y'all go get that land. And Joshua and Caleb were two out of 12 that were in the will of God. They knew what God wanted them to do. They knew God's will for their life. They knew that God had a wonderful plan for their life. Man, let's go slay some giants. Joshua and Caleb, let's go. They, they, give me give me a water gun. I'll charge hell with a squirt gun. You know, water gun, that whole thing. Ten of them said, no, God. That's a man's sovereignty. You know what God did? He allowed them to have their will. Now, not without consequence. They all died in the wilderness. God wasn't happy about it. But God had a will. God had a plan for those people. And guess what? Joshua and Caleb got outvoted. And they got their way. God didn't get his way. God's a gentleman. And he's not going to make you go out and tell somebody about Jesus. As a preacher... I'm not going to make you go out and live right for God. I can't. You have the Holy Spirit and dwelt in you. When you go home, that Holy Spirit is not going to do a judo throw on you and put you in submission if you turn something on the TV or listen to something on the radio that you shouldn't be listening to. Holy Spirit isn't going to make you. And guess what I'm not going to do? Uh, yeah, brother, uh, this is the preacher here. I'm uh, just checking in on you. I'm going to make you do some things that you should be doing. Not only do you not want me doing that and won't stand for it, I don't want to be doing that. Why? God is not in the business of forcing someone to do something they don't and I can scare you half to death. Preachers of yesteryear have done a good job at scaring you. And I believe we should have a fear of God. I believe we should have a respectful reverence for God. I believe we should hate evil. I believe we should stay away from sin. I believe sin's going to hurt people. And I'm going to compel them not to get involved with it. But ultimately, I can't stop you from doing what you want to do. And God didn't stop those ten spies they had a choice to make and they made the wrong choice second thessalonians how do we reconcile this first second thessalonians chapter number two look at verse number 11 second thessalonians 2 verse number 11 for this god a cause god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth? That's who this is for. It is for those who believed not the truth. What do you go out and preach? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. Right? That's what we preach, the truth. You were damned if you believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see anywhere in the verse, anywhere in the chapter, where that is where God wants to send them. To a place of damnation. It is not God's will that they be damned. They chose to believe a lie. You want to believe a lie? Okay. Here's some delusion. God will give you what you want. You want light? He'll give you more light. You want truth? He'll give you more truth. But he is not going to send an Uber driver to your door on a Sunday morning and have that Uber driver drag you out of bed, make you breakfast, put you in the car, slap you on a, a three-piece suit with a slick hair, your hair slicked back, and 
a Bible onto your shoulder and get you in the church on Sunday morning. It's not going. Look, I'd like it to happen. It'd be, it'd be nice if more people took church serious on Sunday morning. What am I going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Love to have you here. Want to have you here. I'll go pick you up. I'll get up at 6 a.m. to make life hard on me and easy on you so that you can be in the church house, be around God's people, and hear the preaching of God's word. How much can you do for people? If they don't want to be here, you can't make them be here. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be real hard for you to get me to not come to the church house. It just is. It just is. You know, I came to the church house one time without any shoes on. You know, I did. I had my truck was stuck in mud, spinning wheels, couldn't get it out. I'm not going to be late for church. We got chains hooked up to it, pull that thing out, get to church. I forgot to take my mud boots on. Oh, I got boots filled with mud. Just had to kick them off and just came in, preached with my socks on. It's going to take a lot to keep me out of church. What do you want? That's what it comes down to. What do you want? What do you want? I could be doing a lot of things on the weekend, a lot of things. And I'm not talking about sinful things. But I don't want to do it. I want to be with God's people. Even if it's only 10. Even if it's only 20. Even if it's only 30. Man, it, even if we go mega and get 50. <laughs> Man, alive. wouldn't that be great? For this cause, God shall send them. It's not his desire. It's not his will. But he shall do it. He shall do it. God. In this verse, he doesn't always get his way. You can't tell me this evening that when you sin and I sin, that that's God's will. Come on. Well, if God wills something, it has to happen or his sovereignty would be in, in question. That is not true. That is not true. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Because that would mean if you sin, that would be God's will. And it's not his will that you sin. But we do, don't we? Yeah. As saved people, with the indwelt Holy Spirit, with the calling of election, as elect individuals into, into a, the elect Jesus Christ, who is the head of the elect church, who created the elect angels and has an elect nation. Amen. How's that for some Thursday night theology? You just got to run all the verses, folks. Got to run all the verses. God says, go out in the highway and hedges and call them to come into my house. May be filled. Ezekiel 18, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his way and live? God has no pleasure in wickedness. What oh, Live. He told him to look and live, man. Look and live, brother. And become a brother. Look and live. Isaiah 55, the Bible says, Ho! That's a that's a Bible word. I know that looks good on a Hallmark card with some pagan troll flying across the cover of it. But look, that's a that's a Bible word. Ho! Ho! Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. You thirsty for God? And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's a gift freely given. That's God's will. We are to offer this truth to all men. We are to strive that man's desires and wants and will would line up with what God wants for his life. We are to pray earnestly that lost people would submit to the truth of the gospel. We are to pray that people would turn from their wickedness and live. Isaiah uh, or Ezekiel 18. And we can only do that with a very devout and steadfast belief that God is not willing that any should perish. Because if you think somebody can perish because they're just part of this group that God selected to just be damned to hellfire, 
That is going to affect your evangelism and it will affect the way that you look at people. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst of come. And who so ever with whosoever let him take water of life without money without life let him take the water of life free